covering. I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching Israeli News Live. Have a very special guest with us here, Dr. Stephen Pigeon uh, from the United States. Uh, he is also uh, the founder of the uh, Et Sefer uh, Bible. Uh, well, we shouldn't say Bible. Actually, this is uh, Steve. What, how do you refer to the Sefer? I mean, the Sefer meaning book in Hebrew, but how would you refer to that in English? Well, we talk about you know we talk about the sacred scriptures. Or a comprehensive, we, we our, our catch line is a comprehensive restoration of sacred scriptures in the English language. And we prefer to talk about it in terms of scripture rather than uh, a Bible, because of course the Bible is Biblos, you know, the, the pagan goddess of Greek writing, uh, also known as Isis of uh, Mizraim, uh, Ishtar, uh, Ashtaroth, etc. And uh, so we, we like to go with the Hebrew name. Amen. I couldn't <clears throat> couldn't agree more. And <clears throat> especially we have so much ISIS in the world today that they're using there in the Middle East. Uh, but anyway, uh, Stephen uh, has been kind enough to join us here this morning. I know for him, it is midnight and uh, it's early morning for us. Only well, it's only about nine o'clock in the morning for us. So we're nine hours difference in time. <clears throat> I am glad to see that he has persevered and willing to stay up late this late at night. So, oh yeah. Oh, this guy has to work a lot. He has to get up early uh, in the mornings for his his work. Uh, uh, Stephen is also an attorney um, and just very very uh, incredible historian as well. And uh, today we're going to be talking. Uh, talk, we'll talk a little bit about the Sefer this afternoon, I shouldn't say this afternoon, at the, closer to the end of the video here, I'd like to go a little bit more into about uh, the work that he's doing there. But before we get into talking about the Sefer, we're going to talk about the neo-Nazi uh, rise here in Europe. Uh, fascism, uh, without a doubt, Ukraine, we know about this. Uh, Steve, I'm ready to really get into your brain on this and your knowledge about the things that, we're, that you're seeing because we definitely see it on our end. Uh, take it away. Well, it's a very, uh, really, it's kind of a terrifying thing at this point, Stephen, because what you're seeing is we're seeing the resurrection, if you will, of the Third Reich. And, of course, most people in the EU do not recognize it. But uh, we have been doing a lot of research here in the United States because a lot of the Third Reich personnel came to the United States in what's called Operation Paperclip following World War II. And th these people, you know, infested, if you will, uh, what was called at that time the OSS, which became the CIA. And the CIA has been operating on behalf of this Fourth Reich really in full bloom since before the assassination of JFK. And you have seen really uh, this elevation of uh, second and third generation children of the Reich uh, who have moved into positions of power and authority in the United States. And of course, what, uh, what most people don't know is that the New World Order is actually an Old World Order, and it is the Order of the Third Reich. That is what they're talking about when they're talking about the New World Order. The difference is, there are two fundamental differences in the New World Order from the Third Reich. The Third Reich, as you know, embraced national socialism, or Nazism, which was national socialism. And it, it, it involved the concept of, you know, Germany, uh, uber alles, right? Deutschland, uber alles, overall. Now you have the concept of international socialism instead of national socialism. And the international socialism is designed to, to bring the whole world under this new world order which uh, apparently was going to see the rise of the EU paradigm over the United States. In other words, the EU was prepared to sacrifice the United States in what would have been a Holocaust nuclear war uh, with Russia, which you and I both know, you've been on the front lines there watching this and watching how the neocons in the United States were agitating for nuclear war and how many times we were really on the cusp of a preemptive nuclear strike, whether it was from the United States or from Russia. Very dangerous situation, but it was being orchestrated by the New World Order, Sycophants, if you will. The primary, uh, the primary agent provocateur of which is George Soros. And George Soros is a self-confessed uh, former Nazi. He was, uh, you know, he worked for the for the Nazis when he was 17 years old in Hungary. 
and he himself being of a Jewish background, delighted in turning in uh, fellow Jews into the internment camps and taking their wealth. Uh, and he claimed that 1944 was the best year of his life. And uh, so he said this publicly. So you've got a real difficulty with George Soros, but of course he's not the only neo-Nazi that is working inside that campaign. Uh, you have the Schurf family, which goes by the, uh, the adopted name Bush. Uh, of course, H.G.W. Bush being born a Scherf uh, to uh, George Bush Sr., uh, George Scherf Sr., who was, uh, his father adopted as Prescott Bush in the United States. The intrigue of the Bush family is really quite incredible. Uh, Prescott Bush was involved in, in the death of Nikola Tesla in 1942. He was involved in assassinations and drug running in China in the, the 30s. He was a part of Union Bank in the United States, who was responsible for financing the Cyclone B, for instance, and other parts of the Nazi war machine. He was actually arrested, tried, and convicted for funding the Nazi war machine through the Union Bank. And Union Bank at that time was a money launderer for the Reich in the United States. There were other banks involved as well. But his son, H.W. Bush, I became very active in the CIA in the early 60s. There's a photo of H.W. Bush standing in front of the Daily Plaza in Dallas during the time of uh, the JFK assassination. In fact, he was arrested, detained, and interrogated for three hours of the night of that shooting. And when he told police he was, in fact, in the CIA, many people believe that the CIA was the operation that was responsible for the shooting of JFK. At least some rogue elements of the CIA. You know, you know, Steve. Let me let me throw throw a thought in here uh, with this. What you're saying there, uh, just kind of back up just for a second to George Soros, um, and it's almost like a pun. Uh, and, and so, so I, when I say this, I don't mean it as a being as a pun. No, as we say, no pun intended. But I cannot help but maybe wonder if there's not some truth to this. When we look at uh, Yeshua and we see that uh, Jesus, for those that don't understand the Hebrew terms for the name of Yeshua, um, but when we look at him and we see in Matthew 24 where he talks about the wars and rumors of wars, and then he says something that I think we, we take it more literal, and, and more than likely that's the way it's supposed to be taken, but it's almost like there are signposts along the way. But then he says, that is the beginning of sorrows. And if you think, of, if you look at it in terms of, isn't it kind of odd that here we've had wars, we've had First, Second World War, we've had the rumors of wars, the, you know, the, the United States, the whole world going to a Third World War, um, you know, a lot of rumors about that. And at the same time, then you have George Soros that comes up on the scene that is working in the background, as you say, you know, as neo-Nazi, uh, and, and not just him alone, the Bush family, etc. We have the others. And, and that has a lot to do with what was the collapse in Ukraine, Stephen, that, that we saw Ukraine clearly a neo-Nazi fascist movement by the CIA. If you look at the documentary, The Way Home, Crimea, The Way Home, uh, and, and yes, we realize that you know, Russia's going to put out their take on it. We could say, all right, that's Russian propaganda, but there's still facts in there that you can't ignore. And Russia intercepted the phone calls that were being done clearly from the U.S. Embassy inside Ukraine. They were... Uh, in, uh, they were um, capturing the phone conversations there with different neo-Nazi, known neo-Nazi members there uh, that they were working with, and this is how they were paying these people here. So the whole rise, and even Petro Poroshenko uh, is, is no, as a known CIA operative to begin with. So the links that we're seeing there, as you're saying, they're, they're, they're going beyond just one nation. It's no longer just Germany now. Uh, they're expanding for an entire global um, conquest, if you, as you yeah, would. that's right. And when you see it, I mean, George Soros was actively involved in the color revolutions. So he was an active part of funding agent, if you will, for the Rose Revolution in Georgia. And I was in Georgia right after the Rose Revolution. It was a very interesting time. And he also perpetrated the Orange Revolution in Ukraine. So following the destruction,
destruction of the Soviet Union, you know, you had what was called the newly, uh, the newly independent states, the NIS. Ukraine was one of those. One of the leaders in the Orange Movement was uh, Yulia Tymoshenko. And Yulia Tymoshenko was, in fact, sponsored by Soros and his NGOs that were operating inside of Ukraine and trying to develop a, a new sovereignty. Of course, what they didn't understand was that Soros would move from what appeared initially to be maybe capitalist enclaves or restructuring of, of the uh, second world under the former Soviet empire into a first world nation with modernity coming in. You know, things like, for instance, you know, the telecom system and the wireless telecom system in Russia before they booted it. But he then switched to a national socialist model, a Nazi model. And he's gone full bore into this international socialism, which appears to be his intent to, to make the move on behalf of the Fourth Reich. Timoshenko is the one who came out and said, you know, we're going to nuke Russians. You know, the first thing we do is kill the Russians. The re regime in Ukraine, uh, the first thing they did, the very first day they took over was they put flyers out all over the Donbass region and going into Crimea demanding the registration of the Jews. I mean, you can find that flyer. You can see copies of that flyer. They have actually had riots now in southern Ukraine saying, you know, no Jews. Uh, and so you, you really have a very anti-Semitic regime, very Nazi regime there in Kiev. And the funding, which is very, you know, it's easily proved. It was done, it was orchestrated by Vicky, uh, Victoria Nuland and her husband, who was actually pumping counterfeit U.S. currency in to pay the mercenaries. All of this was, was being done on behest of George Soros. And so Soros, you know, of course, he's in trouble in Hungary right now. He's been convicted of felonies in France and in Malaysia. He's wanted dead or alive by the Russians. And he's about to be labeled as a domestic terrorist in the United States. But nonetheless, he has been the agent provocateur for the Fourth Reich. Now, the Fourth Reich, I think what's so important about our discussion here is that the leadership in the EU are, are former Third Reich people. And they're not even they're not even elected. I mean, that's what's really odd, isn't it, uh, Stephen? I mean, think about it. They're not elected officials. They are appointed officials, and so we're we're, we're you know we're being set up in Europe for a totalitarian style government. Absolutely. Now, this is one of the things that when you look at all of these tanks coming in that Obama dumped all of this armament in Europe. You know, thousands of tanks and all of these Bradley carriers. You know, it was basically an arms transaction. Now, there's some great discussion about uh, this Operation Gladios and, and its uh, machinations through the CIA, which includes as part of its machination this deployment of arms, uh, arm caches into a region before they come in and work those arms domestically. So even though those arms right now are on the Neva River pointed at Russia and, they're, and they may be you know, in the Donbass region pointed at the Donbass area, and, or in, even in Poland pointed at Belarus, so on and so forth, with the hundreds of thousands of troops and all of this armament, that armament, remember that a tank turret does a 360 degree pivot. And do not think that those turrets are not going to pivot on those very same people. And so the next thing, you know, Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia, her, her being told, the Russians are coming, the Russians are coming, are suddenly going to find the Germans are already here. And you don't have a choice about whether or not you leave the EU. We have closed the door. We have tanks on your border. And you are not leaving the EU. And it's an unelected regime full of Nazi heirs, heirs to the Third Reich, that are sitting in position, unelected positions, with no accountability. You can't vote them out. There's no accountability for the leadership in Brussels. So you have, and of course, so you have certain elements. That's why the, why the UK did the Brexit. They, they, first of all, they were looking at the EU pushing for a war with Russia. They didn't want any part of that. And the Brits, and now what's so curious about it is you're seeing an alliance beginning to emerge. That looks a lot like the alliance that followed the, the breach of the Ribbentrop-Molotov uh, Treaty, the, the non-aggression pact between Germany and Russia. You know, right after that pact fell through and the Germans put 8 million troops on the Russian border, what you see is Russia then allied with the UK and the United States. You see this alliance forming again. The UK, the, the United States, and Russia are forming an alliance against who? 
the Germans who are controlling with absolute authority the EU. All right. And, and I'm telling you, all of these weapons are going to be turned on the citizens therein. All right, Steve, let's, let's look at a couple of things here because what you're saying, <clears throat> I didn't think about it from the idea of a Nazi type of takeover, but one thing that we were watching already with all the equipment coming in and the talk uh, in Slovakia when the, uh, when the ministers were meeting there, me and Jana were there on the ground covering that uh, in Bratis, uh, excuse me, not Bratislava, but uh, yeah, Bratislava, <clears throat> we were there. The foreign ministers of the European Union were all meeting about what they called a New World Army. And of course, the very idea of the New World Army, or World Army, I think I don't think they say New World, but a World Army was kind of uh, ludicrous in the, in, in the fact that it's just Europe. Why is it called a World Army uh, in that case there? We were also looking at the fact that this is probably why they have created the refugee crisis uh, and that they were bringing more and more this type of a military presence here in Europe to use it against the people. That was the only reason we could figure. That's why we said that we know that uh, the European Union leadership was a total totalitarian style government. We said that there. And now, even now in Eastern Europe, now they're beginning to move the refugees in here. The very places that they said they would never accept it. Of course, the Prime Minister of uh, the Czech Republic, he was willing to accept them. Uh, the President, uh, uh, as we know, uh, he, him, him being Jewish to begin with, but he didn't want them here. <clears throat> but nonetheless, he doesn't have his, he doesn't have the authority. So he has caved in, and and now they're coming in by the truckload, so to speak. I think we're getting six thousand more refugees here in the Czech Republic. I think that is being used to stage the unrest so that they can justify the means. You know, as the old saying goes. Uh, or as their saying goes, you know, out of chaos we will bring the order. So mm -hmm. that's what it looks like to me. And and but like you said, I'm I've watched too uh, with uh, President Trump. Uh, you you take President Trump. I mean, he's trying to do what he says he'll do, but he's being subverted at, at every corner. Uh, oh yeah, you know, trying to overthrow his presidency at every opportunity. Yes, and then at the same time, Theresa May, with the Brexit and Vladimir Putin, they seem to be more on one, one mind, one thinking, lift the sanctions, get restoration of economics to there, but there's a totally different entity in the background that is determined to derail all of this process, uh, and that's what I see coming. Uh, you're, you know, let, let's continue let's on with this. that derailment is going, okay? There was a very interesting event that took place here not, uh, last week, which was that the Pope dismissed the head of the Knights of Malta. Yes, he did. Now, when he dismissed the head of the Knights of Malta, now the Knights of Malta have been around an independent organization for a long time, but he replaced the Knights, the head of the Knights of Malta, for, and, and you know the rumor was that the Knights of Malta were supporting birth control. The truth is, the Knights of Malta were supporting Trump. And so he pushed out the leadership of the Knights of Malta, and he brought in this feller, this fellow, uh, uh, von Boselager. Son, son of a neo-Nazi neo that they have tried to make him look like he was a great guy because he tried to assassinate Hitler, uh, which he was only doing that because he was angry because he started taking out gypsies, I guess people that he liked, and, uh, but he's also, his father was so guilty of the largest massacre of Jews in the entire history of the Nazi regime. So, who do you think they have appointed as the head of the Knights of Walter? Fourth Reich. Fourth Reich, right? And so you see the Pope is acting as an agent provocateur now for the Fourth Reich, and he's claiming that anything he doesn't like is anti-Christian. Now, now the, it begs the question, of, first of all, we have to ask two questions. Are Catholics Catholics or are they Christian? That's one question. The next question is the highest rhetorical question ever asked about Pope Francis, which is the Pope Catholic. And uh, that's always has become a real major question, given that he's prayed in mosques and that he's had imams pray in the Vatican and so on and so forth. So you have somebody that's working conspicuously to allow for this importation of, of the Muslim refugees by the millions into Europe. And I can tell you there's going to be a huge, huge, huge influx of refugees into Europe as soon as the weather gets better. And once it does, now what I foresee happening is you're going to see this martial law proponent coming in, 
which is we have to have greater police. We have to have a greater police state to crack down on these guys who are continually raping our girls in Sweden and in Cologne and et cetera. And then once you get this martial law cracked down, then you're going to say, well, the only way we can really cause these Muslim refugees to respond properly to the European society is to put them through military training. And all of a sudden, these men who are between the 18 and 35, which constitute about 80% of these refugees, are going to be wearing EU uniforms. You know, I was just listening yesterday, Stephen. <clears throat> there was an imam out of um, Belgium, and he stated publicly, he said, we right now constitute about 40% of all the children that are in the schools now. And he says, you guys are thinking you can do a counter-revolution against uh, the Muslim uh, community. He says, well, maybe if you marry four wives and start pumping out a lot of children, you could. But I highly doubt that any of you will ever do that. He said, so, time is on our side. And before long, we will enact Sharia law in Europe. And you're going to see it happen in your lifetime. And he also brought out... Uh, or no, excuse me, I, I, when we were bringing this out on the news last night, one thing that I shared with the people there, and I'm, I need to photograph this for people so they can see it, everywhere here in Europe, and you may have saw this when you were here, Stephen, we're starting to see billboards pop up with, with European, uh, I should say European-looking woman. In other words, it's, uh, <clears throat> that's not a racist way of saying it. I, I say that because like if you're in the Middle East, you have more of an olive complexion. Uh, in Europe, they, they tend to be more fair-skinned, and they're putting these type women on the billboards with head coverings on. They're not calling it burqa, but they're, they're putting on there the wording in the Czech language that the people need to embrace the cultures of other societies and that wearing a head covering can be fashionable. So they are preparing the society yeah. here so with the message. Ask. Yeah, they're preparing them for a Sharia society. And, and, and it's coming, Steve. I mean, I don't know of any place on, on the planet right now. I mean, maybe you do. Maybe America is safer, but I'm afraid they're trying to bring a revolution in America as well. Soros, is, he's good at bringing revolutions everywhere. And, uh, and unfortunately, the younger generation in America is falling for this by the truckloads. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah, the, younger America, the younger generation of America has been trained in communist thinking. They're, I mean, they really are... Of brain, hard brainwashed communists, and of course they use the idea of women's rights and minority rights, and you know, and uh, uh, you know, sexual orientation rights as weapons in the hands of these young people. But the truth is, they are after bald power. Period. They want power. They're willing to kill anybody who use any kind of means to get the power. And all of this nonsense about rights is just lip service. It's a weapon in their hand against conservative Americans. And so this is what they're doing now. When you talk about this Arabation, you know, they call Europe in the Middle East, Eurabia, right? You know that the demographics are so significant because of the, you know, let's just call it what it is, the sins of the Europeans, right? You have, you know, high practices of abortion. You have high practices of, of uh, birth control. You have the willingness of most Europeans is to not have a family at all, one child, Two at the most. Most most parents do not have two children. They have one. Most people want to be selfish in their life. They want to drive a new Beamer and, and to have five weeks of vacation and sip coffee downtown. And because of that, you have a you have a plunging demographic. I mean, a destructive demographic where the German the German birth rate is one point one. The French birth rate is one point one. You know, you have most of the countries are between point nine and one point one in the birth rate. And so the Muslims are right. They come in with a birth rate of 3.4 or higher. And yeah, unless you're prepared to practice polygamy, and even if you did practice polygamy, I, it, most demographers do not believe that the Europeans themselves can recapture their populations in the next three generations. In the meantime, Pope Francis is saying you need to, because you are unwilling to birth children, you need to embrace the refugees, you need to plan on allowing your daughters to marry the refugees, and plan on you know giving giving birth to an entire Islamic population. Now, one of the things that ha happened with uh, with Hitler is in 1935 Hitler made the statement 
that Nazism is not best under Christianity, but would function better in an Islamic society. Whoa. There are students of Hitler who believe that Hitler survived the bunker, escaped through Spain to Argentina, you know, through the Canary Islands. Yes. Went to Argentina, he was in Argentina for a time, and then he went to Brazil for a while, and then he left, and he actually migrated to Indonesia, where he died in Indonesia in 1970, having converted to Islam. Now that, that becomes a critical point. If Hitler converted to Islam before his death, and he's the Fuhrer, then you see that the Reich has made a move inside its policy decision-making to say, look, we can rule better if we have an Islamic society because the imams can control from the ground up. We don't have to have the massive police state when husbands are doing honor killings and imams are cutting people's hands off and so on and so forth. So what you see is you see this push to create an Islamic society over which you will have a Nazi Reich in a national socialism uh, governing all of the Europe they couldn't hold when uh, in 1944 and 1945. And this is what's coming. So this is what you this is why you're seeing what you're seeing in terms of the social order. Now, there's lots of backward pressure against the Reich. There's some factors in place right now that were not consistent with the situation in 1938, 39, 1940. Number one, you have the whole world financial situation on the verge of collapse. Everybody has borrowed the maximum amount they possibly can. The next round is gonna cause catastrophic fiat currency failure. So you have the Germans coming in and say, well, we can, run, we can manage the EU. Well, no, they can't. You have this because the, even under the, the combined currency, the fact that you have disparate states like Greece, or Italy, who are capable of mismanaging their economies, at least in the eyes of the Germans. That's unacceptable. So this is why they have to impose a single state. The EU's already talked about it. An army, single state, you can have multiple, you can have multiple languages, but it'll be one governing government. And one so military Brussels, as well, right? Steve. One military. That's what they're talking about doing here. That's what we saw in Bratislava. There is going to be one military, and you will, be, from every one of these nations, you will be contributing your soldiers to train in one military. Mm -hmm. And think about 40% or 50% or even 60% of that military being Muslim men who have come in as refugees over the, over the last year and this next year. And so, yeah, you are going to see the hajib being imposed on European women. It'll be mandatory. You'll see the doors open for Sharia. That's going to happen very quickly. You see the population demographic begin to shift, and you're going to see all, all of this armament that was brought in this year being pointed at the civilians inside the Reich. So this is why, Steve, what you're seeing, this is why that the all the equipment that was moved uh, into Europe, especially that to the eastern part of Europe, this is why they were all moved there to begin with. It's to bring the, 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 the nation here under control. And that may explain as well, Stephen, why they did not even bother to paint the desert. That, that's the reason, Steve, what we're seeing here in Europe, uh, when, when Obama sent in all this equipment, desert camo was on it, and they never bothered to change the color. And that really didn't make sense to me. If you're, if you're going to go into war against Russia and you're bringing in all this equipment here, why would you leave it all desert-colored camo and everything? I mean, do you not think that the Russians can't spot that a lot easier from the air? And, and yet, at the same token, it's like they don't care. But if you're turning it against the people and against the nations that you're already sitting in, they know they can't overtake you. And, of course, it's only more for an intimidating factor at that point. I mean, what are you going to do, run out in the street with your BB gun and and shoot the tank, I mean, I mean it's absurd. So, right. so this is the reason why they're doing it. Yeah, that's exactly right. And I think, you know, it's been very well disguised. But, you know, the, uh, the, the machination of the New World Order, like I say, you had the whole concept of pushing the European common market into the EU market, and then eventually into the EU, the common currency, and, and, uh, and the so-called constitution, which is not really a constitution at all, the unelected management out of Brussels, and, and now you have catastrophic collapse that appears that the Greeks cannot manage their country, the Spanish can't, can't manage theirs, the French can't manage theirs, the Italians can't manage theirs, the Irish can't manage theirs. Therefore, the, the you know Germany has to manage it through Brussels. The Reich has to manage it. 
And so I think you're going to see once these banks collapse, I think you're going to see what will happen is instead of coming in and saying, let's do quantitative easing to put the banks back in order, you're going to see, let's move tanks in and remove the government and install a, a uh, you know, a supranational government, government out of Brussels. All right, and Steve. There's nobody in Europe that's prepared to, to resist that. There's no possible resistance inside of Europe. No, there's not. Now, all right, now in, in line of this right here. Where does that, where does the United States fall in all of this? Because uh, Obama sent all this in. We're not seeing at this point President Trump bring anything out. In fact, if anything, the, the weapons keep flowing in. Uh, now Romania, they've all flowed into Romania. We've even got a destroyer in Romania now. We have uh, troops pouring into there like crazy. Uh, it is literally, and not just Romania, even Italy. That was one that blew me away, Steve. Why is the U.S. military now in Italy? That's not on Russia's border. So it is making more sense of, from what you're saying here. If we begin to really look at the demographics of what uh, the United States has been doing inside of Europe along with Germany, and, and in reality, by the way, some people may not realize this, and this only proves your point that the, that the Third Reich went into the United States, worked through the CIA, etc., because Germany is considered an occupied territory, and therefore they really do not move without the consent of the United States, and that being through the CIA, a Third Reich uh, uh, environment over them, they're making their moves based on what the United States is saying. But if this be the case, and we know that Trump would like to have peace with Russia, uh, is Trump really not being able to change what is happening on the ground? I mean, is he really finding his hands tied? And that, uh, and where is this going to leave the United States itself? What are they planning on trying to do with the U.S. in this type of case? Are they also going to try to bring about the same thing in the United States as they're doing in Europe? What's your thoughts on that as we close down on this? Well, you know, it's possible. I mean, I can tell you what I think is the situation. You know, uh, Mr. Trump has moved as quickly as he can. President Trump has moved as quickly as he can. However, the stonewalling that's going on is absolutely absurd. He's, they have delayed his, appoint, his cabinet appointments the longest of any president in the history of the country. You know, and, and he comes out with a completely constitutional edict, you know, shutting down immigration for 90 days to make sure that ISIS people do not end up in the United States. And some, some second-rate judge out in Seattle, where I live, uh, shuts him down. And the courts hold it. I mean, it's absurd. And the next thing you know, you have violent, you know, you've got violence all over the West Coast, which is the most prolific violence that's going on. And they're all paid, by the way, these people that are committing the violence out here. They're paid mercenaries. To yes, do they it. are. But the problem is that what you see is that most of those arms were sold to the EU. The arms that you see being pumped into the EU were all sold to the EU. Obama sold them. You know, the Mr. Peace Prize, who dropped a bomb every 24 minutes over the eight years of his presidency, sold those arms to Europe. And so those arms are being delivered pursuant to sales contracts. Wow. And, but, but you can see, there's no Russian threat to Italy. No. But what there is to Italy is an EU threat. And the government in Italy better figure it out, figure it out pretty quickly. I mean, what you're going to see is you're going to see an underground like you saw during the Third Reich in France. That will be, you know, the resistance in France, there'll be resistance in Italy and so on and so forth. But it's going to be very difficult to resist totalitarian regime that is using uh, of these Islamic immigrants as their spies and their foot soldiers. And so, you know, the, the crush that they intended for the United States is now being visited in the EU. You have an overwhelming tide of refugees. These refugees are going to be employed as the military, and they are going to displace the Europeans who live there in order to create this contiguous Nazi state of Arabia. And uh, remember, you know, the old Holy Roman Empire, right, which is neither holy nor Roman. And this one is going to be a German Reich that's not going to be German either. And, uh, you know, we talked a lot of that, you know, who knows how Erdogan fits into this and the Turkish government, what kind of, uh, what kind of, um, you know, if this thing happens, will the Turks move their NATO military, their substantial NATO military over the Balkans in the, in the Southern Europe to close that door? You know, it's possible. Well, Steve, and, uh, so what we see happening in the United States is a real question. First of all, do we believe that Trump is who he is? Now, most people, the people that, that, that are in my group, want to believe that Trump is an answer to prayer, that he has a Cyrus anointing, 
that he has a Yehu anointing, you know, or whatever. They want to believe it because, of course, we've lived in desperation over here for 16 years, right? And technically, we've lived in desperation since the, the yeah. HWB presidency uh, because that's when the right was announced on in uh, September 11, 1991. And so as a consequence, there will be, people are desperate. People would love to have, we want America back. Is it a facade? I don't know. I think personally what's going on is Trump is doing the best he can, but he has he's up against a deep state that does whatever it wants to do. And we're, that's and obvious. We're, he can drain the swamp, right? Yeah, that's, and it's obvious. We're seeing that with every stone wall that he's come up against as, uh, as he has fought uh, against uh, the forces there inside of America. And... Uh, Boy, there was something I was going to tell you a second ago, something you said, but I've, I've already forgotten it now. We'll have to pass that on up there. But uh, I, <clears throat> it, is, it is absolutely obvious that, that, that we're, we're headed for a major downfall here. Oh, I know what it was now. Turkey. Erdogan. And this is from an intel source that I have that worked with Gulen Fagan uh, personally. Uh, a friend of mine, uh, I should say a friend, it's a, more of an acquaintance that contacted me that... Uh, has proven that he worked with Gulen Fagan, which is the one that Turkey is accused of masterminding the CIA coup against Erdogan to overthrow the nation. But he told me, he said that, uh, he said the one thing about Erdogan, he said Erdogan was promised a major role if he would do the dirty work for uh, before the United States and for the European Union, that he was promised a major role. This is why he has pushed for coming into the European Union to start with, uh, that in the New World Order he would have a, a major role in that. And I think this is another reason why we see that the Sunni population was allowed to migrate into Europe because he can control them. And so as he lined up there with all the uh, soldiers from the Ottoman Empire era in the photograph that they did with him, he is looking to be a major leader in this and I have suspected from the beginning that he would have a major influence on the European Union in the near future. And so what you're saying there lends to a lot of credibility to that, Stephen, and, and, and it's not looking good at all. And uh, one quick question. <clears throat> this is something that's going to weigh in a lot of people's mind as well because we've talked a lot about Soros and how he has played a major role from an early on uh, age uh, dealing, you know, turning against his own people, uh, gathering all their wealth. That's how he become his multi-billionaire status. Uh, where is Henry Kissinger in all of this? Because Henry Kissinger, a lot of people look at Henry, Henry Kissinger as the architect of the New World Order. He's, he has very close ties with, uh, with President Trump. Uh, uh, he has close ties. Well, let me put it this way. President Putin, he has a very close ties with him. There's no doubt about it. He stays there at, at, at Putin's resort when he comes in to see him. Uh, and also with President Trump, he claims to be a very close and personal advisor to President Trump. And, uh, you know, every, every leader that is, that is uh, even, even with uh, Britain, for example, so it seems like that he runs on that side there. How does he fit into this picture as well? Soros we see dealing with the Nazi uh, Third Reich regime and bringing that about. Where is Kissinger in all of this? Well, Kissinger fancies himself as the new Prince Metternich. And Metternich, as you know, was a power broker out of Vienna who essentially crafted a peace in Europe that lasted over 40 years. And uh, so Metternich you know, had his foot in every camp. And Heinz Kissinger has had his foot in every camp. You know, he's had his foot in, 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 in as a communist operative, he's had his foot as a Nazi operative, and he's had his foot as an American operative. And so he plays all of these camps kind of in between, he fancies himself as Prince Metternich, and the, 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 the peace broker, if you will, peace broker, power broker. Is he, an, is he a neo-Nazi? You know, probably not. I mean, he's got his feet in there, but he's probably not, not the neo-Nazi. George Soros, you know, operating on behalf of, of course, the Rothschild Bank and others who's engaged in power broking. But Soros has a particular agenda that is consistent with the neo-Nazis working out of Brussels more than he is working with the bankers out of, out of the crown in London. And so he, his furtherance is to really move this new world order. You know, a lot of people want to point the finger at the Rothschild family in London and saying these guys are the main power brokers driving the world because they finance World War One and World War II. But 
But they leave out the fact that it was American banks that created the Soviet Union. It was American banks that created the Third Reich. It was American corporations that built the Panzers. It was American corporations that perfected the Cyclone B, that built Auschwitz. Those were built by American corporations, funded by American banks. You, you know, you can't leave out, you know, the, the American banks have gotten away with this for a long time. Point the finger at somebody in Europe and everybody blames them, ignoring the fact that it was American interests that did this in order to create an American hegemony over the world, and which is what has happened. And, you know, you have a similar situation here. Right now, it's all about arms dealing. That's why the EU is full of arms, because we can sell the arms, we finance the arms ourselves, and we sell the arms to you, and then we take that money back and put it in our own coffers. And the military-industrial complex continues to grow rich. So when you're looking at Kissinger, I mean, the, the big operative, really, the Asian provocateur extraordinaire is George Soros, no question. Yes. And, and the question is, who are his, who are, who's leading him? And I can tell you, and you know it as well as I know it, that our good friend, the Pope in Rome, is a significant player, having married the Jesuit order to the Catholic order in a single person. And now he's married the Knights of Malta to the Jesuit order. And the Jesuit order is tied directly to this NWO leadership. As they were tied to the Third Reich, so they are tied to this Fourth Reich. And, and, and you know that he's also equally tied to Erdogan in Turkey, He's made his own arrangements with all of that group. And so that group in all is all coming together now to bring rise to an international socialist order under the old Nazi regiment. Wow. Steve, that's, that is extremely provocative. And it, it seems like more so as we watch this, and his, Henry Kissinger may be more of, even though he's playing a role, he may be more of the smokescreen so that Soros can really get things going. Because as you mentioned earlier, Soros was in Ukraine. Uh, you know, he, you said he funded it. He was there uh, uh, before the coup got started. You know, it's always funny how that happens. And, and of course, John McCain and Lindsey Graham uh, just there recently saying that uh, 2017 is going to be the year of the offensive against Russia. Uh, but, you know, they're, they're talking about those in the eastern part of Russia. So many things that are happening and I think it's going right up underneath the noses of the people, Stephen, and, and, and nobody's paying attention to this whatsoever. It's really sad. Um, in closing, Stephen, let me, let, let's uh, kind of shift gears just a little bit because everything that we're seeing almost seems like um, we are definitely in a biblical time. We're in a biblical age. We're, we're seeing prophetic things that are coming to pass. And the Sefer, what what you and, and, and Brad Huckins represent uh, together, the work that y'all have done in order to bring this out uh, to the world, to introduce us, trying to get this to the, to the hands of the people, gives the people <clears throat> not only the, the, books of, uh, uh, the books that they have read and scriptures that they're, that they're accustomed to, but it also brings back restoration in the language. It also brings back books like the book of Enoch that should be part of our our everyday reading uh, that we should be able to have. And the Book of Enoch is incredible. Uh, they, ju they just, you know, I, I find that the Book of Enoch was really kind of thrown under the rug more so by the Jewish community than it was uh, even by the, the, the Christian community because of the fact it's too obvious of the Messiah in there. Uh, so, but it's part of the Qumran Scrolls, so we know that it was very much used by the Tzadok priest. And, uh, but if you can share with our viewers as well uh, this amazing project that you guys have worked on for, for years now and, uh, and how they can go, ahead, go about getting it. <clears throat> we know that if they listen here on our channel and they, and they come and they were to, <clears throat> uh, to purchase the book, they can get a discount by doing so just by uh, putting in INL, Israeli News Live, INL in, in the, uh, uh, well, you can tell them about that part, Steve, how that works there. And, sure. Yeah, it's a very important part. It's a very important part of our ministry and what we're doing with the book. You know, Enoch was a big part of it. You know, we go to all these prophecy conferences in the United States, and all the modern day prophets are all quoting Enoch. You know, it's it's just crazy. I mean, everybody is looking at Enoch because, of course, as we put in the preface, even though Enoch was denounced by Rabbi Yochai, and there there been you know they burned every copy they could find. Somehow, the book of Enoch was preserved. And it was preserved. It's a latter time prophecy. It says so in the book that it's a latter day prophecy. 
for the people of the latter days, and it's been preserved for just that purpose. When we put together the Sefer, we were looking at it and saying, we're going to look. People should be reading the Apocrypha. People don't want to read the Apocrypha because the Apocrypha, like the Bible, has been abused by various churches for their own particular agenda. And some people will exalt the, the wisdom of Solomon. Some people will exalt the first and second Maccabees. But one of the most beautiful writings in the Hebrew literature is, of course, Fourth Esdras, which we have in our book as Fourth Ezra. What an incredible book. And again, rejected by the, by the Judaism because of the Messianic problem which, by the way, are incredible in 4th Ezra, but rejected by the Christian community because it points to the Torah. It's the same thing with the Apocalypse of Baruch and 2nd Baruch. It points to the Torah. Again, you know, part of the walk of this faith is walking in accord with the Torah. It's not some license to walk a life of sin and expect that you have salvation under some kind of cheap grace. When you read the rest of the books, you discover what the real, what the way, the truth, and the life really is. And so we started looking at these books. We said these books have to be included. I, I was reading these books, and I had a, I had a, a three ring binder. That was my Bible, and I had so I had all these books in my three ring binder. Same and I here. And I said, you know, are we going to put this under a cover, right? And he said, yeah, let's do it. You know, so it took us eight years to prepare this edition. Eight years and nine editions before we came to this edition to produce it. And we came forward with the transliterated names, 3,100 transliterated names. We added the Aleph Tabs, which we think are extremely important, especially since Mashiach says in, in Kizayon in Revelation, I am the Aleph Tav. He says it three times. Yes. Well, if he says, I am the Aleph Tav, and there's 9,300 Aleph Tabs in the book, you've got a pretty good idea. There's 9,300 prophecies about him that are realized, including twice in Genesis 1-1, right? So the book it becomes very, very important. Now, you know, it's an English book, and I mean, you know, I love watching you work in, on the Danun Institute, where you have the Hebrew up on one side and you have the English up on the other side. It's fabulous. It's terrific instruction. But a lot, a lot of people struggle with just the transliterated names we have <laughs> in the English in our book. Yes. So we have to find some kind of medium that says our book is a book in the English language. It's a comprehensive restoration in the English language. And for the student of Scripture who says, I've got all these questions that I can't get answers for in, you know, Bereshith or Shemot, in Genesis or Exodus, but you find them in the Book of Jubilees. And the Ethiopian church, of course, has been reading that book for 2,000 years. Uh, the Book of Jeshur that you teach out of Yashar. What an incredible, incredible book that is. And the illustrations about Isaac and the illustrations about Joseph and, yes. and, and the battles that happened between Esau and, and Jacob and all those things that take place. Tremendous account in Jasher. So we put all this stuff together under a single hood, if you will. Uh, and we were very careful not to add Gnostic Gospels, not to add corrupted, you know, notoriously corrupted books. And you know what I mean? When you read something like uh, the, Patri the Testimony of the Twelve Patriarchs, beautiful book. But in almost every one of those 12 testimonies, some Christian went in there and added language he wanted to see. Yes. And, yes. you know, so we have, we have to be very careful about what's corrupt and what isn't. And so we went to the best text we could. And, of course, it's 1.3 million words. We spend a lot of time going through those words. What about this one? What about that one? And as we learn, we learn from Hebrew commentators all the time who will say things like, for instance, the former and latter reign really means the teaching reign. And if you read in the Sefer, you'll see that it says the teaching reign in that passage. And so there's so many things that, uh, that we've explored. Uh, the passage in Zechariah talking about two women in the basket. That makes no sense to anybody, two women in a basket. Two fires in a silo? Ah, that makes a lot of sense. And that's how you read it in the Sefer. So, yes. We think the book is of the highest integrity. We've really been, we've had our foot in the fire for a long time now. And it is a book that, for the believer in Mashiach, the believer in the Messiah, it is a book that glorifies that holy name. It glorifies the name of the Father, it glorifies the name of the Son, and it is a book for the English speaker, the English reader, to really have a serious study Bible and a reference upon which they can rely when they're looking at what did that say here? What did that say there? Can we find a, a text that is the closest to Hebrew that we can get? 
we think, or, or the closest to the Greek, and we think we're the closest. I think it's an outstanding uh, resource, and we've been using it now for, I would say, about four years. Uh, I want to say it's been that long since we actually got our first copy, and uh, you know it, it is incredible because you have everything, uh, as you use the analogy of under one hood, and uh, and it's something that nobody else has really done. And I think it's important. I think it's vital. Um, as you mentioned, the, the different books. I, I like the book of uh, Jasher especially. And I think that it would be important for the believers today because you find out that there is a gift that is in the children of Israel that is a very supernatural gift that is to be handed down from one generation to the other. And maybe a lot of people don't realize that that gift lays within them if they are descendants. But we see this with, with Ephraim and Manasseh. Manasseh particularly because he has a gift of, of strength like that of Samson. And as <clears throat> even, even a calming uh, effect, he would lay his hand over on, on Judah and he would just calm down. And he said, no one but the children of our father has this gift. And uh, so, especially in light of the fact that we are going to be faced with some very troubling times in the future, it could encourage faith of people to realize that they could rise above all of that. Uh, Steve, I, I want to thank you for coming on Israeli News Live today. Your insights and valuable, and uh, what you have shared, what is going on in Europe, especially for our European listeners, it is going to be a major uh, uh, benefit for them. Uh, we have one sister that listens in that translates a lot of things to German. I have a feeling she's going to want to translate this to German as well. Uh, we're going to be putting up a page in German on our website, so uh, that will really be good to have the subtitles in German on this one. Uh, in light of how serious this is. So thank you for coming. And tell us, uh, Stephen, how can people, what's the website, if you can tell us the name, it'll be in, be sure, guys, if you're watching this video, make sure you're on Israeli News Live because even though we do have several people that do post our videos out there and uh, we appreciate what they do, some do have the permission to do that. Uh, that's why we get not just our 25, 30,000 views. Normally it's about a half million views on a video that we do, but it's because of a lot of friends that are sharing it the way they do. But on Israeli News Live, you'll have to switch over to our channel. Look in the description below because a lot of our friends that do post a video, like Channel 428, that they do that. They have permission to do so. They may not catch the fact that we want to put that link in the description below. So look right here underneath the video. Make sure you're on Israeli News Live and then take and look there. You'll find uh, the link right to the website that Steve's going to give you now. Sure, and if, when you come to the website, which is at sepher.net, C-E-P-H-E-R.net, when you come to the site, you know, it's easy to shop and, and, and to get the book. Uh, and when you get the book, there will be a coupon code uh, offer for you there. And if you plug it in, uh, I-N-L, Israeli News Live, then you're going to get a 10% discount off whatever you purchase. So if you purchase the book, if you purchase the tabs that mark the various books inside the book, if you purchase the cover that allows for easy carrying, if you buy additional books like the, the Ed Sefrim, you know, the, the Yom Kodesh or the Parshat or some of the other books that we're offering, any of those additional offers, all, the same discount applies. And so you get the discount from that. You can get free shipping if you if you don't mind snail mail in the United States. International shipping is more expensive and takes a little bit longer. Uh, or, excuse me, it's faster, but it's a little bit more. You, know, you have to pay for the shipping. Uh, but, uh, but even so, uh, yeah, we really encourage people to come on uh, to take advantage of the discount. Because, of course, we love the brothers and sisters that are that are part of our uh, that are part of our program, and you know, and of course, Israeli News Live. As you know, Stephen, it's a very special organization to us. Uh, we were so blessed to be in Prague and to meet you and Yana, and uh, it was quite incredible and uh, uh, very memorable even to this day. And so, um, we really appreciate your ministry and what you're doing. I just wanted to let you know that. Thank you so much, Steve. Thank you. 
Anyway, guys, you've been watching Israeli News Live. Definitely check out the website there. Uh, it's also a, a benefit and a blessing for our ministry as well here. So we do thank you and thank you for your support in doing that. Uh, so have a great day. God bless you and shalom. I'm Stephen Benoon with Israeli News Live and Danun Institute will probably be airing this same broadcast as well. So shalom to all of you out there at Danun Institute as well.